All right, well, hey, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Dan Ward, uh, formerly Lieutenant Colonel Dan Ward in the U.S. Air Force. Spent about 20 years in uniform as an acquisition guy, engineer, program manager. Spent the past two years as an author, speaker, consultant, and just as of two months ago, uh, joined MITRE. Uh, so we saved the best topic for last. I'm here to talk about the Federal Acquisition Regulation, the far everyone's favorite, most exciting topic around. So we'll try and do this in five minutes or less. Now, a lot of the uh, acquisition reform and acquisition improvement discussion Focuses, focuses on the FAR specifically, how to fix the FAR or how to avoid the FAR. We either want to make it better or do away with it entirely. Uh, not a lot of people like the FAR. Not a lot of good comments about the FAR. It's complicated. It's a bureaucratic set of requirements that kind of gets in the way. We often point to it as the reason things take so long, cost so much, and go so badly. Um, so that got me thinking, what would a good FAR look like? What would I like the FAR to say? So I made a quick list, four things that I think would, go, would belong in a good FAR. Um, number one, uh, the FAR should encourage innovation and local adaptation. So it should encourage innovation, not discourage it. It should encourage local adaptation, that is, rather than treating every agency, every project, every division through a cookie cutter process, allow the uh, process to be modified and changed depending on the unique needs and situations and circumstances of any individual agency or organization. Second, uh, we should use simplified procedures to the maximum extent possible. In fact, my second book was all about simplicity. So I'm a big fan of simplicity because complexity makes things cost more, makes them take longer, makes them more fragile. Complexity gets in the way. Simplicity uh, removes some of those barriers to participation. The third one is uh, the ideal FAR, the good FAR, would provide minimum administrative burden. The FAR is kind of the definition of administrative burden. Uh, and finally, the fourth thing, the, FAR, the good FAR should include lots of acquisition flexibilities that do not require an emergency declaration to use them. We heard earlier, uh, the first panel said, you know, hey, as soon as something is urgent, as soon as something is important, as soon as there's a war going on, the first thing we do is we toss the process out the window and say, just go do the right thing. Just go do it the smart way. So we have all these agilities and all these flexibilities, but we only use them if there's an emergency. So uh, in summary, the, the four things, let me read them one more time for you. The system should encourage innovation and local adaptation. We should use simplified procedures to the maximum extent possible. We should provide minimum administrative burden and should include many agile f uh, acquisition flexibilities that do not require an emergency declaration. I think that's a pretty good start. That's what a good FAR would look like. And here's the twist, those are all quotes from the FAR from today's FAR. That's what the FAR actually says. You see, every time I think of something that I wish the FAR would say, I go and I look for it and I find it. And that's the big secret, is to go off and read the FAR. When I tell people I'm reading the FAR, they look at me like I'm crazy. Nobody reads the FAR. Hey, you know, we should. I've come to the conclusion that ignorance of the FAR is a greater barrier to innovation than the FAR itself. And time and again, every time I go looking for something in the FAR that I wish the FAR would say, bam, there it is. The FAR is not perfect. It's hard to read, it's long, it's complicated, it's intimidating, it's bureaucratic, it's dense. But it also contains a lot of explicit statements in favor of speed, agility, simplicity, flexibility, innovation. Uh, it doesn't just allow these things. In a lot of cases, it insists on them. That means anybody who is pushing in the direction of speed, thrift, simplicity, agility, and innovation is not only consistent with the, far, uh, the letter of the FAR, but the spirit of the FAR. And anybody who's trying to insist on conformity, on complexity, on taking time, being very rigorous and thorough and standardizing everything, those are the people who are violating the FAR. And we need to let them know that. So to piggyback on something uh, Jade mentioned, one of the things uh, I developed really for my own use as an Air Force acquisition guy, as an engineer, as a program manager, I put together a little document of my favorite FAR my favorite FAR clauses, and I would carry this around. So when I go in and I'm talking with a contracting officer, I'm talking with a decision maker, uh, I'm able to sort of quote FAR chapter and verse. And I found that people who can quote the FAR chapter and verse not only win the argument, they tend to be right. They tend to be correct. Uh, and so when I say, hey, I want to do something innovative, I want to make a, a modification, I want to change something, and here's the part of the FAR that says I'm allowed to do that. Kind of sucks the air out of the room. Nobody can really argue with that. Um, so if you'd like more specifics, I did put together this short document. Again, it was initially just for my own use. I've since cleaned it up, and you can download it from my website. Maybe we can get it on the, we'll tweet it out. We'll get it on the CNAS website somewhere. Um, not perfect. This isn't the final, the final word on how to improve the FAR. This is just sort of my favorite clauses, pieces, portions of the FAR that I found to be useful as an engineer, as a program manager. Um, 
to help improve the, the simplicity, the agility, the flexibility, the speed, and the innovation. Uh, and just as a quick uh, data point, when I did this uh, in my last project while I was on active duty, um, it was an $84 million radar project. We were building hardware and software and doing test flights, so we're putting stuff up in the air and making it fly around and do stuff. Uh, we did our first test flight a month ahead of schedule. We did twice as many test flights as originally envisioned, and we finished $8 million under budget. Uh, out of an $84 million program, um, which was actually the smallest program in my division, so it sounds like a lot of money, but we were actually pretty little. But $8 million under budget, it was a nice project to go out on, and that's the kind of results that we've been able to realize when we do this kind of stuff. So that's me in five minutes. Dan, thank you. I, um, I feel uplifted. I feel hopeful. No, I, I know I sound sarcastic. That's just my, that, that, that's my accent, but I actually am. Um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. We could do questions, but that would mean we wouldn't have time for drinking, uh, and, and I think we should prioritize that. Um, I would just like you all to, to thank our lightning round speakers. It's a fantastic collection of expertise that we've had up here. Um, as, as we wrap things up here, we will make sure that we're posting things um, to, to Twitter. You'll, you'll have links for a number of the things that, are, that we've discussed today, most notably the DIUX's CSO handbook. Uh, for those of you who are here in the room, uh, not following online, there are a number of folks from the DIUX who are here who you can talk to, to um, uh, during the social time. Um, and uh, Johanna and uh, Lauren in the back, uh, and there are some other folks around. But uh, Chris is here as well, Chris Kirkhoff. So please feel free to, to, to ask them questions, to have follow-up conversation. That's why we've created a social time. So thank you all for, all for joining us, and I hope you're able to take this knowledge and implement it uh, rapidly and with good outcomes for the taxpayer. Thank you all. Bye-bye.